Welcome to Sage Audio. Today we're talking about how to make a mastering chain. But first, if you have a mix set you need mastered, send it to us to receive a free mastered sample of it with the link in the description. Conceptualizing a mastering chain. Before we begin to pick out our processors, it's important to understand what we're trying to accomplish and the general routing. Each processor that we include is gonna affect our signal one at a time and in the order that they're inserted. All buses will occur after our last processor. I'd like to start my processing on the channel, then include buses if needed before finishing my processing on the master output. Let's listen to our mix and then master so that we understand where our session is headed. Watch for the scanners, watch for the scammers. We be setting standards, we be setting standards. Watch for the scanners, watch for the scammers. We be setting standards, we be setting standards. Picking your first insert. Picking the first insert in a mastering chain can be challenging since it's going to determine the direction of your master and affect all of the rest of the chain. A good first insert is either going to be a subtractive EQ to attenuate parts of the spectrum or a mastering preamp. I prefer subtractive EQ, with which I'll attenuate parts of the signal that I don't want to amplify, which sets me up well for having a successful chain later on. Let's take a listen to this EQ, and remember that the effect is going to be subtle since we're mastering and since it's the first insert. Watch for the scanners, watch for the scammers. We be setting standards, we be setting standards. Only going forward, they don't going backwards. Anytime we in the booth, it's a fire hazard. If you're enjoying the video, hit the like button. It helps us bring you more videos. Is DSing needed? Sometimes a mixing engineer won't account for how abrasive sibilance will become when the overall level of the mix is increased. This means that we may need to do some DSing. If needed, I like to add my deesser after the subtractive EQ to dynamically attenuate any harsh frequencies. You could use your EQ to attenuate this, but then that frequency is going to be attenuated at all times, making a deesser the better option. Let's take a listen to the effect that the deesser has on the mix. Watch for the scanners, watch for the scammers. Watch. We be setting standards, we be setting standards. Only going forward, they don't going backwards. Anytime we in the booth, it's a fire hazard. Compression, saturation, or both? Both compression and saturation will control dynamics from the peaks down. Compression is more flexible, letting you compress from the average loudness, change the behavior, and so on. But saturation is much more program dependent and sounds a little more natural while adding some harmonics to fill the sound. I typically don't compress a full mix and instead use saturation, but you can use both to first control dynamics in a very accurate and specific way then add some harmonics and analog sounding dynamic control. Let's take a listen to just compression for the time being. Watch for the scanners, watch for the scammers. Watch. We be setting standards, we be setting standards. Only going forward, they no going backwards. Anytime we in the booth, it's a fire hazard. Only a small percentage of people that watch our videos are subscribed. So if you're enjoying the video, consider subscribing. It's free and you can always change your mind. Picking a saturation type. When creating a mastering chain, the saturation type that you choose can greatly affect the timbre of your master. Tape and transformers are going to compress moderately and can attenuate higher frequencies, resulting in a mellow sound. Tubes compress slightly, accent transients, and emphasize both the low end and high frequency range. I find that I use tube saturation most often, and I lean towards warm tube saturation to include a second ordered harmonic, but use your ears and carefully decide on which one works best for the song. Let's take a listen to some subtle tube saturation on a mix and note that I've removed the compressor that I used in the last demonstration. Watch for the scanners, watch for the scammers. Watch. We be setting standards, we be setting standards. Only going forward, they no going backwards. Anytime we in the booth, it's a fire hazard. Using reverb when mastering. You might be curious if you should add reverb to your chain and in my honest opinion, it shouldn't be added. Typically, it's going to disturb the spatial relations that have been established when mixing, making for a washed out sound or one in which the dimensionality of the mix is less apparent. With that said, use your ears and decide what's best for your session. Let's listen to the chain with some subtle reverb added and know that I'll remove this for future demonstrations in this video. Watch for the scanners, watch for the scammers. Watch. We be setting standards, we be setting standards. Only going forward, they not going backwards. Anytime we in the booth, it's a fire hazard. Increasing low level detail. 
We typically think about controlling dynamics from the peaks down, but there are some ways to increase signal from the quieter details upward. I could use an upward compressor to measure, compress, and amplify quieter parts of the signal, but instead, I'm going to use the Oxford inflator. This processor prioritizes bits of information with a positive value over those with a negative value, meaning it's going to increase the ratio of signal to silence or high-level signal to low-level signal. In my opinion, and according to the developers, the best way to use this processor is to put the effect to 100% and then adjust the input to determine how aggressive the processing is. Let's take a listen to it and how it increases the impact and presence of the mix. Watch for the scanners, watch for the scammers. Watch. We be setting standards, we be setting standards. Only going forward, they no going backwards. Anytime we in the booth, it's a fire hazard. If you're enjoying the channel, join the community with the link in the description. The importance of additive EQ. At this point in the chain, it's a great idea to include another EQ with which we'll amplify parts of the signal we want more of. Since our ears are much more sensitive to 3 to 5 kilohertz, we could amplify this to make the mix sound a fair amount louder. We could also amplify parts that are hard to hear, like a super high frequency range, to add some air. Furthermore, we could use mid-side EQ to narrow or widen the stereo image by amplifying the mid or side respectively. I like to amplify some of the side image's highs and mid frequencies, then amplify 3 to 5 kHz on the mid, and maybe some of the kicks fundamental. Let's take a listen to the effect that this additive EQ has. Watch for the scanners, watch for the scammers. Watch. We be setting standards, we be setting standards. Only going forward, they no going backwards. Anytime we in the booth, it's a fire hazard. Picking the right limiter. The limiter that you choose is going to have a huge impact on your sound. I personally enjoy limiters with multiple algorithms so that I can cycle through them and find one that works best. My recent go-to has been the Oxford limiter with its enhanced feature at a higher level. My favorite free option that I found is the Sys DSP Factory Limiter 1, which has a really aggressive and detailed sound. So let's listen to the Oxford limiter and use about 3 to 5 dB of attenuation and notice how the signal is certainly louder, but also much more impressive regardless of the additional loudness. Watch for the scanners, watch for the scammers. Watch. We be setting standards, we be setting standards. Only going forward, they no going backwards. Anytime we in the booth, it's a fire hazard. Automating a mastering chain. Now we have everything in place and it's time to make the master unique by having the processing respond to the emotionality and the intent of the song. To do this, let's automate in and out various features to increase or decrease the loudness, fullness, and other parameters. I think a great way to make a master more engaging is to increase saturation or upward processing during choruses or maybe just the last chorus to differentiate it. Let's listen to both the saturation and the enhanced feature of our limiter being increased to better understand the purpose of automating our processing. Watch for the scanners, watch for the scammers. Watch. We be setting standards, we be setting standards. Only going forward, they no going backwards. Anytime we in the booth, it's a fire hazard. Understanding metering and monitoring. Last up, let's consider what metrics we should keep an eye on. I, like most engineers, will use a LUFS meter to understand the perceived loudness. For this master, I'm gonna make it negative 14 LUFS since YouTube is gonna try to normalize this video's entire level, not just the demonstrations. And when it comes to peaking, I'm really not too concerned with it unless it's happening on the master output. Due to 32-bit and 64-bit internal processing, our signal can go above 0 dB without clipping so long as it's returned to below that level before the master output. So let's take a listen one more time to our before and after of the master and keep things like the frequency response, the dynamic range, and the level of distortion in mind. Watch for the scanners, watch for the scammers. Watch. We be setting standards, we be setting standards. Watch for the scanners, watch for the scammers. Watch. We be setting standards, we be setting standards. If you have a mix that you need mastered, send it to us to receive a free mastered sample of it with the link in the description. Thank you so much for watching.